It's 9 a.m. Good morning. Buenos días. Dear participants in the IMAS Illinois Mexico Symposium, welcome. Bienvenidos. The University of Illinois System, universities in Chicago, Urbana Champaign, and Springfield, welcome participants from 20 states in Mexico and guests from El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Central America, Colombia, Perú. Buenos días, estimados colegas y amigos de diferentes instituciones en México y otros países de Centro y Sudamérica. Sean ustedes muy bienvenidos. My name is Elvira de Mejía, a professor in food science and human nutrition, the director of the Division of Nutritional Sciences, and the coordinator of IMAS at the University of Illinois System. Today marks the establishment of the University of Illinois System, Mexican and Mexican American Initiative, and Mexico on water and the environment, fundamental aspects of water quality, quantity, and contaminants. The objective is to promote the strategic associations among scientists in Mexico and Illinois on water and the environment. After the initial welcome from the president of the University of Illinois, Dr. Timothy Kalin, we will have a series of 12 presentations by outstanding speakers from Mexico and Illinois, as you can see here in this series of slides. Then we will have the opportunity to go to breakout rooms based on your interest on water quality and quantity, room one, or water contaminants, room two, for a questions and answer session. Finally, all will come back to the main room for a summary of the conclusions and next steps. Please write your questions in the chat and we will make sure to request the speakers to answer your questions later if time does not allow to answer all the questions during the symposium. The symposium will be recorded. Please stay connected. I thank the president of the University of Illinois System, Dr. Timothy Kalin, for his support, leadership, and enthusiasm recognizing the need and the opportunity that I must represent. Now is my privilege to introduce the 20th president of the University of Illinois, Dr. Timothy L. Kalin, who will offer a welcome to all participants. Mora. Good morning and welcome. Bienvenidos to this IMAS Symposium on Water and the Environment. Lo llamo IMAS en lugar de IMAS simplemente porque siempre hay más que hacer. I'm incredibly pleased that IMAS, which was launched less than a year ago, is already speeding ahead, providing opportunities for cross-border collaboration in such critical areas. One of the major goals when IMAS was created early this year was to begin providing more opportunities for students to travel between our universities. On our end, we intend to provide life-changing educational opportunities for more Mexican students at our universities in Havana, Champaign, Chicago, and Springfield. I'm very excited about this. But we also want to build deep connections around research and discovery links between the brilliant minds of work in our three universities in Illinois and those at our partner universities, Tecnológico de Monterrey and the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Through these developing networks, we can work together to create opportunities for the people of Mexico and the people of Illinois and to solve problems that affect all of us. Over the next couple of hours, Leading experts on both sides of the border will dig into two interconnected areas that certainly are fundamental to our shared future. Our goal is to help people understand water crises and to take concrete steps towards defining sustainable, clean water mitigation strategies around the world. It's no hyperbole, of course, to say that issues related to water and the natural world will define much of our future. Water scarcity already affects many millions of people. More than 700 million people live in critically water-stressed areas across dozens of countries, according to the United Nations. More than 40% of the world's population is affected by some degree 
of water scarcity. More than 55 million people a year are affected by drought, according to the World Health Organization, and that situation is only being exacerbated by climate change. You can see it right now in Afghanistan, Iran, and the American West, to name just a few areas being parched by drought. And storms of all kinds are growing more severe in their impacts because of our changing climate. Floods, devastating winds, tidal surges, and the many other impacts generated by stronger and more frequent tropical cyclones. Looking through the list of topics on the agenda today, though, gives me a spark of optimism. Researchers who are among the leaders in their fields are part of this symposium, leading discussions around the causes for many of these problems, as well as potential mitigations and solutions. You will be part of discussions on emerging technologies to remove toxic metals from water, discussions on climate change and its effects on water, talks on food production and, and resiliency, and so much more. Just as important, today's symposium will offer the chance to build a platform for researchers to connect, communicate, and build teams to work together going forward. All of us must be working together to build that way forward, and solutions will come from the connections made in gatherings like this one and future events led by IMAS. It gives me a great sense of pride that together our universities can be a force for good and the changes that are necessary to build a prosperous, sustainable future Mexico for Illinois and for all of North America. So again, welcome, bienvenidos y muchas gracias. Thank you so much for being a part of this symposium and sharing your expertise, your energy, and your commitment to creating a better tomorrow. We hope this gathering offers you the opportunity to make new connections and to generate the kinds of ideas that these big challenges demand. Thank you, President Kali. We will start with the first presenter, Dr. Prasanta Kalita. We cannot hear you. You are muted. Yeah, here you go. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos Thank you. Dias. And this is a pleasure to be part of this wonderful initiative. And thank you to all my colleagues and friends within the University of Illinois system and our Mexican friends from all the 20 states out there. So thanks to Professor Di Mejia for initiating this uh, new collaboration. And I hope we will move forward with a strong support and with strong will. So I will talk about, you know, this is my background. Um, I'm a professor here at the University of Illinois. Urbana-Champaign basically work. Uh, I work in my research project in all the five continents, both in water quantity and water quality issues. I, uh, I have uh, some projects uh, that, that related to uh, uh, developing best management practices, some policy changes, and also heavily involved in food production and, and uh, food security issues and as well as water security issues. Uh, uh, so with that one, I will start with my presentation. As you all know, as President Clean also mentioned about the water issues that we all, I am sure everybody that is attending the meeting today and beyond, we all know about what a serious state we are in terms of water, both you know, in terms of water supplies and water qualities. We do not have enough water. We do not have enough water to meet the demands of, of irrigation, food production, industry, drinking, health and sanitation. As you know, with the new challenges of COVID and other things, we need more clean water to be, stay safe, stay clean, and all those other medical requirements. Water quality can be the largest threat to our human health and sustainability today. Pollution is happening from industries, municipalities, agricultural use, and other major drinking water uh, sources in all over the world. The picture shows that you know, the world population is increasing. 
by 2050, we'll have two more billion people on this planet, about 9.3. The green one is the urban population. As you see that, that is going to be about 6 billion by 2050. And larger and more urban population will demand more and better food and better water and better accommodation and, and more better access to water. I just learned that even in Mexico today, 386,000 people do not have access to clean and safe water. And as President Clean said, all over the world, that is a major problem. Now, what are our challenges? We need to produce more food and we have need to do more water. 70% of our water goes into food production. Along with that, climate change is our, our biggest challenge right now. You can see the effect of climate on food, water, ecosystem. Each, each degree of temperature rise with carbon dioxide concentration going up there, you know, we are having, we are getting the proof of, of the change in our local, regional, and national climate. We can see that, you know, the crop yield is gonna decrease or the temperature rise, you know, we will have sea level rise threats and it's already, the researchers are already providing that information in, in respective journals. The ecosystems are facing serious extinction problem. Lots of droughts, flood and heat waves are, 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 are coming and we all have experienced that thing. So, among all the things, today I will talk more about the water quality issues. With the food production, in the food production depends on the fertilizer used. And one of the main fertilizers, the nitrate, in the form of nitrate, nitrogen, which is highly soluble and it gets into all our water, drinking water resources in the groundwater, in the surface water, where people are using. Soil can only absorb so much fertilizer and in most places worldwide, people are over applying fertilizer. Today, we have about close to 200 million metric tons. If we add the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, these are the basic elements for plant growth. And then more than 200 million metric tons of fertilizers are being used. Are they all getting into the plants and the increasing the yield production? No, they get into our water resources and the nitrate, nitrogen, uh, can cause serious impact, negative impact on health, human health and the ecosystem. If you drink water more than 10 milligrams per liter and you know, consistently, you can get into some serious health issues. One is called methemoglobinemia, which is the blue baby syndrome and other many other associated disease can happen. Now let's look at where most people are using these fertilizers, this is 200 million metric tons. United States, you know, after a long time, after many, many research and practices, we have reduced our fertilizer use. Right now on an average is about 125, 128, which is an world average. But look at where the population rise and the more fertilizer dependent economies are China, almost 400 kilograms, almost three times more than what we use in the United States. So you see that lots of water quality problems are happening there. In addition to that, pesticides, which is another uh, serious threat to our environment and our human health. Worldwide, we have about 2 million metric tons of pesticides are being used. 45% is used in Europe and others 25% is used in the US and the rest in 25% in the rest of the world. Pesticides are applied to, to, to control the disease and weeds in, in the cropland, but they get into the food chain throughout the world. And now, you know, there are diseases such as cancer and other things have been linked. I'm giving you some examples of in the US, in the United States, we do a lot of research to control water pollution. However, this picture can tell you how much pollutants we have. In you know, about 266 kilometers of river system in the US, about sediment pollution is happening by 47% and nutrients, the nitrogen fertilizer polluting about 13% and the pesticide and all that. Similar one you can see in the, in the lakes. Here is a unique 
hydrology that we face, uh, the reason I'm showing this, this is linked to the hypoxia problem in Gulf of Mexico, the big, big water quality problem. We have you know, modified our hydrologic system by putting drainage systems in the entire Midwest. Millions of acres of land is being drained by artificial drainage. That means there is a drain pipe which short circuit the water and the chemicals from the fields into our river. And eventually they get into through the Mississippi River all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. You all probably know the nitrate loss in the Mississippi River has caused one of the greatest challenge of water quality in our country. And also I'm sure uh, our Mexican colleagues are very aware of this thing because this is diffusing into your part of the world. And like President Clint said, we need to work across the border with teams and all out there. So the hypoxic zone is the biggest problem for us. So what we need to do, we need to do, you know, a lot of, a lot of good quality, solid team research. Long here, I put some of the mitigation strategies. Long-term research needs to be done multidisciplinary with multi-stakeholder data intensive, multiple weather conditions to take care of how do we become resilient in the climate change scenarios, multiple land use, land cover condition, and multiple receiving bodies means lake, river, ocean, and all that. We need to totally characterize the non-point pollutant pollutants and their transport processes, both for surface and, and groundwater environment. Watershed basis, one thing we do always in a very small scale field experiments, but we need to look at in the larger scale, you know, on the watershed scale and bringing everybody together. And we need to develop our curriculum. Most of our engineering and science curriculum are old. We do not modify them based on our latest find, fundings to teach our young generation. One example that we have done here at Illinois and the Midwest is like subsurface bioreactor. This is one of the prime, prime infrastructure, I would say, to control the water quality, you know, the draining, all the nitrogen, nitrogen coming from field. You can see the picture here, all the water that is coming from the field, you know, if you, if you, put a bioreactor at the edge of the field, you can, with the help of bacteria, you can degrade the nitrate and release the nitrogen gas into the atmosphere. So the relatively cleaner water is gonna get into our river. And eventually uh, with that strategy, we should be able to control uh, the hypoxia problem and many other water quality problem. Other, a uh, few other very proven BMPs, the best management practices, practices that we all use we have long-term research on wetlands and you know all the all the water with bad water quality stays in a wetland let those plants in the wetland absorb that and and and, and transform that into nitrogen gas and relatively cleaner water will get into the our ecosystem riparian buffer vegetative filter strips fertilizer management and pesticide management we need to split those we cannot apply all the fertilizer and pesticide in one shot without knowing what would happen tomorrow. If you apply fertilizer pesticide and then you don't know the weather, the rain might come tomorrow and wash everything and it goes into our ecosystem. Terraces to control soil erosion, conservation tillage or cover crops to keep everything on place and you know, keeping the surface cover and do more nitrogen efficient crops or nitrogen fixing crops up on the atmosphere. So there are multiple different type of conservation practices or the mitigation strategies, but we cannot work on it all to all alone. We have to work in a team. We have to work across the border and bring our experts and involve our citizen. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you so much, gracias. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Calita. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. Now we have Dr. Victor Castaño. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, good morning. Uh, buenos dias. Thanks uh, to Dr. Elvira de Mejia and Dr. Uh, uh, Chamorro for inviting me to, to uh, this event. I'm uh, very glad to be here. And uh, I would like to share with you today some of the work we have done 
in uh, using nanotechnology for uh, solving or attempting to solve at least one very big problem that uh, perhaps people in the water technology treatment uh, area has not uh, paid enough attention to it. I'm a physicist by training. I have worked with uh, nanotechnology for almost 38 years. Uh, I believe I'm one of the very first in Latin America in, uh, in uh, uh, entering this uh, field back in the 80s uh, of nanotechnology. Uh, one big problem that we see in the next slide is uh, that uh, according to this very recent article that was uh, published only a few months ago, three or four months ago, one uh, big uh, issue in uh, water pollution is the presence of heavy metal uh, in water. And uh, one could think that uh, this is uh, anthropogenic, that is uh, part of uh, uh, the industrial uh, uh, activity of humans, but also uh, we are realizing that uh, there are uh, many uh, iron metals, uh, including uh, ar arsenic, uh, manganese, uh, mercury, lead, and many others due to natural processes. For example, uh, in places like Mexico, uh, every year we dig deeper and deeper uh, in, into the soil to extract, extract water. And uh, that means that uh, we are, for example, in Querétaro, where I, I live, uh, using every single day in our households uh, water that is 10,000 uh, years old. That is basically uh, water that uh, was there even before uh, the, the, the Greek civilization uh, appeared. Uh, and that's a, a cultural problem but also it is a very important technological problem. So our approach uh, uh, for this problem, which is very significant because uh, the size of a metal ion is basically the size of even smaller than the size of a water molecule, is uh, very, very difficult to extract from uh, any means, including physical and chemical means. So uh, what we decided is to use uh, nano reactors. What do you here on uh, the left hand side on the upper part is uh, in a schematic representation of a, a nanoparticle. This particular case was a silica nanoparticle, but we have used many other uh, uh, nanoparticles in which uh, naturally through, uh, due to the uh, chemical processing, it, it has some uh, uh, hydroxyl group. And uh, uh, through some uh, convenient chemistry that we have developed, we are able to attach to that uh, 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 to those groups on the surface of the nanoparticle different groups. In, in, the, in the upper part, you see HF groups, which are very very uh, reactive with uh, many metals, and uh, at the bottom you see some NH2 groups. And uh, from that, we can have uh, with only few grams uh, or even milligrams per liter of uh, water a very, very high number of uh, these groups able to react with uh, the metal ion. As uh, we see uh, in the next uh, slide, this is a result of uh, how much uh, uh, mercury we are able to remove in uh, time ranging from uh, the starting point to 150 minutes. And uh, you can see that uh, depending on the chemistry concentration of uh, HS or NH2 group on the surface of the nanoparticle, we are able to remove between 80 to 99% of uh, uh, the metal ions in water without, and this is very important, any further treatment, no heating, uh, not even agitation. Uh, because of the size of the nanoparticles, they diffuse uh, uh, through some brown, Brownian movement into the into the water, and by, and uh, as they move, they are they begin to collect the the ions. The next slide shows uh, similar uh, things for chromium. Chromium is a very very important solution uh, 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 material uh, ion 
in many industrial areas because uh, it's related to, to many important industries, the automobile industry, the aerospace industry, and even the shoemaking industry in, uh, in the central part of Mexico. And as you can see here, we compare uh, the remotion of chromium in water uh, by using uh, nanoparticles with different uh, groups. And uh, you can see that the, in some cases, in less than 10 minutes, we are able to remove uh, more than 90% of the ions. And we compare this with uh, the main technology that is being currently used, which is uh, activated carbon, that as you can see, first is not as effective. And second, and most importantly, it is uh, uh, rapidly uh, saturated and uh, loses effectiveness. Then uh, we move to the next stage, which is uh, looking for nanoparticles, nanostructure in nature that could do the job for us uh, to avoid any uh, potential problems with the presence of nanoparticles in water. Uh, what about if we use uh, feathers? I don't know if you ever thought uh, what happened to the feathers of all the chickens that we... Well, they are basically very important pollutants. They are made out of keratin, which is uh, one of the strongest polymers we have discovered, and they can stay there basically forever. And uh, so uh, every single time we consume eggs or chicken, we are contributing to the pollution of uh, of earth, soil, and, uh, and, uh, and water. And the idea here was to, to use that uh, nanostructure that you look at the, uh, the left-hand side of the picture, which is the molecule of keratin, which by the way, is a very interesting uh, uh, helicoidal structure, similar in, uh, uh, in shape to DNA. The next slide shows uh, uh, a picture of, uh, of this DNA structure. And this DNA structure has uh, naturally some uh, active sulfur sites, which as I said, and we demonstrated before, are very, very active in uh, reacting with metals. And uh, what we basically did was uh, to extract uh, nanocaratine from uh, chicken feathers, uh, from the garbage, and uh, pack some uh, uh, plastic tube and allow the water to go through. And you can see here that in less than five minutes, we are able to remove almost 99% of the pollutants. In this case was uh, 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 chromium also. And uh, we also designed uh, 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 a treatment of the chicken feathers to improve the, uh, the uptake of uh, this uh, ion. Next. <clears throat> Uh, this is uh, the, the system. We uh, uh, use uh, polluted water with uh, 20 uh, parts per million of chromium sticks, which is a very, very high dose and a very uh, dangerous uh, pollutant. And uh, the next slide shows uh, it, uh, on the uh, left hand side the uh, water with 20 uh, parts, parts per million of chromium sticks. And the second, uh, on the right hand side shows the, uh, the water after five minutes of treatment. Uh, uh, the, uh, the chromium was uh, removed up to 99%. Uh, One minute. Yes, then uh, we also produce uh, nylon fibers, uh, commercial nylon fibers impregnated with uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, obtained from keratin from chicken. Uh, and in the next one, you see some uh, uh, of these uh, structures. Uh, you can see the first structure of the membrane, the nylon membrane, and you can uh, see the uh, uh, micro and nanospheres of uh, keratin uh, uh, with only uh, about 1% of uh, keratin to the, uh, into the uh, uh, membrane. We are able to remove uh, basically 99% of the uh, chromium, uh, uh, manganese, uh, lead, and many other uh, ions that uh, we have tested. 
And uh, the next uh, one is basically my, all my data. And uh, thanks again for the invitation and the attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Victor Castaño. Now we have Dr. Rafael Tinoco. Hi, good morning. I also want to thank the organizers. Thanks for the invite and thanks to everyone that is attending this, this important symposium. Uh, well, my name is Rafael Tinoco. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois. I got my degree in civil engineering at the National University in Mexico, at La UNAM, in La Facultad de Ingeniería. So it's a special feeling to be here today. I got my master's and PhD degrees from Cornell University. I went to work a little bit as a postdoc at the Environmental Hydraulics Institute of Cantabria in, in Santander in Spain. Went back to Cornell working always in environmental fluid mechanics. And since 2015, I'm part of the civil and environmental engineering department here at, at Illinois. So, I'm part of the Water Resources Engineering and Science Group within the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. It's a large group dealing with a lot of different topics, hydroclimatology, hydrology, remote sensing, water resources systems, all of these problems uh, nowadays with water, energy, and food nexus. We are dealing now with new branches that uh, address photosynthesis engineering. We work with environmental fluid mechanics, urban hydrology, eco-hydraulics and morphodynamics, which is my area, and also with topics with groundwater. I'm a laboratory guy, so we have some excellent facilities around here. We have the Vente Chao Hydro Systems Laboratory here on the left, the new Eco Hydraulics and Ecomorphodynamics Lab on the right, and some field facilities that we can use to collect data from rivers around the area. So in particular, my group is working on this Eco Hydraulics Lab, and I'm going to show you some of the facilities and some of the projects that we are conducting um, nowadays. So just to give you a very quick tour of the Hydro Systems Lab, this is the new version on the new building from 2021. So we have quite a, an assortment of different flumes of different sizes where we can reproduce riverine and coastal uh, conditions so we can try to investigate or to isolate specific processes that we want to reproduce in the lab. So we are living in a climate, uh, in a changing climate. We have a changing le sea level we have changes in how the water is moving in the atmosphere and in the, in the land. So we need to account for all of these changes. And if we, need to, if we want to understand them, we need to separate these fundamental processes. And that's something that we can do in our, in our laboratories. So we have facilities that allow us here on the left, an oscillatory tunnel to recreate these oscillatory conditions on, on the ocean, wave tanks to reproduce the dissipation and uh, distribution of energy on, on the coast. We have meandering flumes that will allow us to reproduce more accurately the sediment morphodynamics, sediment transport and morphodynamics in, in rivers. We have flumes that allow us to, to study turbidity currents, gravity currents, uh, sediment transport in straight flumes as we have on the bottom or in meandering rivers as we have on, on the center. Nowadays with our new lab, the Eco Hydraulics Lab, we have some here in the right is a eco flume, a racetrack flume that allows us to, to work with fish, to work, uh, to work with fish eggs so we can bring biology, bring the ecosystem into the lab to see how uh, the hydrodynamics is affected by the biota and also how the biota is affected by the hydrodynamics. On the left, we have an arrested front facility also to study gravity currents, which is a problem that we are trying to, to assess. On the right, we can see a wind tunnel. On the center, there's an annular plume for transport of sediment at smaller scales. On the left, we have this uh, replica of the Chicago River that we are also using or planning to use for some additional projects. We have some smaller scale facilities on the top right, a small racetrack flume on the left, a small uh, YouTube oscill uh, oscillatory tunnel also to recreate these coastal conditions. On the bottom, we have a hyporake uh, flume to reproduce the transfer of material between the, the soil and the water moving on top of it, where we can reproduce some of our, our riverine and coastal conditions and analyze it with our uh, particle image velocimetry and laser technologies for our for our measurements. So those are our toys, but what is the goal of our, of our lab? Well, we want to investigate all of these flow biota sediment interactions, mostly through laboratory experiments, because we want to understand all of these physical processes that are driving these interactions. And we want to use our understanding about turbulent features so that we can understand processes at small scales and then apply these solutions for large scale problems. So basically here I have these representation of some type of ecosystem in a coastal area, these acrylic cylinders representing vegetation that I like to use in my experiments. But now we need to assess how that biota is going to change the sediment transport uh, uh, conditions. 
sediment resuspension, deposition, surface gas transfer. When we talk about oxygen or, ca or carbon in lakes, in the ocean, in, in rivers, we need to account for the effect of the ecosystem and also how this will alter the habitat for endemic species and for invasive species in our rivers in, and in our lakes. And for all of that, we are analyzing how this all is affected by, uh, by turbulence at different scales, both in terms of time and, and space. So I'm just gonna give you a quick tour of some of the, the projects that we are working on recently. One of them is the effect of vegetation, the effect of ecosystem on the dynamics from the substrate to the surface. So if we are dealing with uh, mangrove forest, if we are dealing with uh, seagrasses, we know that if we have aquatic vegetation, it will change the way in which the water is moving. It might reduce velocities within those patches of vegetation, but it will also create increased areas of increased uh, velocity above those plants. We are increasing the levels of turbulence. We are increasing resuspension of sediment depending on the conditions of the plants. That turbulence can, can also enhance the gas transfer from the, from the atmosphere to the surface. So we can try to reproduce those, those processes in the lab and see whether or not different types of plants will enhance the position or will enhance um, resuspension of this sediment and how it's being transported based on the morphology and the population density of those, of those plants. So we have that project that we are collaborating with the working with the NSF. But then about habitat, we have here on the left a famous image of Asian carp, of grass carp, these fish that jump on the river and it's quite a hazard for boaters and fishermen in, in rivers and lakes in the United States. So we want to catch them early so we can take eggs and larvae of these species, these invasive species, and play with them in the lab. And that's what we see here on the, on the video. So we have different larvae of these species and we can play with them in the laboratory and change the, the hydrodynamic conditions. So we explore which are the conditions that they prefer, which are the conditions that they are scared of. So we can try to prevent or monitor the spread of those invasive species in wherever we don't want them to be. When they grow up, now they are better swimmers. So when we deal with projects of stream restoration, stream naturalization, dam removal, we need to see how the new turbulent, flow, turbulent conditions of the flow are gonna change the swimming capabilities of the fish. So we can test in the lab how different structures with different dimensions and different uh, orientations are gonna change the swimming capabilities of different species, either with trout, with bass, or when we have a chance to play with lamprey, which is another uh, invasive species in the Great Lakes. Again, how we can create conditions that are favorable for trapping them or conditions that are favorable for scaring them away from certain areas. And that's a project that we are working on with the uh, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. One of the ways that uh, people are trying to use to prevent their spread from these species is with bubble barriers or bubble curtains. So generate a curtain of bubbles that will scare away these species. This has been used for transport of microplastics, for capture of microplastics. So here on the, on the left, you can see a video of that curtain acting as a, to, to redirect these fluorescent particles. And what we want to see is, can we fine tune this structure so that we can use them to prevent the spread of these different species? And talking about this transport, we also can deal with drifters. And by drifters, we can refer to microplastics, we can refer to eggs from different species. And in, when we have changing conditions on the flow, changing conditions on our rivers, we want to know where are we gonna find them, how they are gonna move, where can we trap them, or how can we create some sampling strategies that will be representative of what we actually have on a river. So we can recreate those conditions on the lab, and now track those particles to understand better how they are moving, how we can capture them, or how can we monitor them more accurately. And finally, another project where we are looking at mixing in streams and estuaries, and what we'll see here is a top view with a, with a thermal camera flow coming from top to bottom, and we can see the merging and the mixing between these two, two confluences. So I mean. we can use these type of techniques on the, on the field and in the lab to explore how mixing occurs when we have different types of, obstruct of, of obstructions. And by obstructions, I mean my aquatic vegetation, my biota that is established on, on these areas. So we are testing all of this technology in the lab, but then we are seeing how we can apply it on the field. So you have all of this assortment of different projects and technologies that we can use to bring nature into the lab and then bring the lab into nature. But we are trying to, to, to approach this challenge. So this street light effect that has, oops, 
our engineers and geoscientists look under this street light because that's the area where we are feeling more comfortable, the area when, we, when there is more light. But then we have biologists and ecologists looking under their own area of expertise. And in reality, we know that the answer is somewhere in the middle. So we need to abandon our area of comfort so we can find those, those answers, those solutions. And with that, thank you again for the, for the invitation. And that will be all for me. Thank you very much, Dr. Rafael Tinoco. Now is the time for Dr. Agustin Breña, please. You can share your slides. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we'll share. Now, can, can you see now the, the presentation? Yes, perfect. Thank you. You can expand it if you want. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, th so thank you very much uh, for the invitation, uh, Rafael Tinoco, and uh, for this uh, initiative. So um, at the end, I decide to. Um, to change a bit the, the, uh, the title of my presentation, uh, which is uh, at, the, at the beginning, I was thinking to talk about evapotranspiration at the very, with a, at using a very high resolution product. But at the end, I will give a more broad overview of one of my favorite projects uh, that I think uh, we're doing right now at IMTA since uh, a little bit more than one year. So for those who don't know me, I'm, uh, my name is Agustin Breña. I'm currently Deputy Director at INTA. I'm in charge of the hydrology group since uh, almost two years ago. And before that, I was uh, a tenure professor at the Institute of Engineering at UNAM. And before that, I spent some time in the Midwest at Michigan State University, uh, working on satellite and remote sensing products. And um, since my appointment at INTA, I, I've been working on new topics mostly uh, related to precision agriculture, uh, agricultural water management, and of course, I mean, still the, my topic, my favorite topic, which is remote sensing of, of, uh, for hydrological, of the hydrological cycle. Uh, and uh, I have, um, um, my, my, my graduate degrees are from uh, Swiss Federal uh, Institute of Technology in Switzerland, in Switzerland, of course, and my PhD in university, from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Uh, so uh, the background, I mean, I, I want to start with showing these uh, two maps that display the drought conditions observed in Mexico this year. Th these two maps were uh, um, uh, generated by, by NASA. And on the right and the left, left side, you see the evaporative stress index, which is a proxy for uh, soil moisture uh, stress. And that this, this picture comes from May 5th, uh, the beginning early May in, of this year. And on the right side, you see the, the map of, of uh, two months later. So as you can see, the, um, what, what, what caused the, this, uh, this situation well, was uh, we had a, a La Nina year, which brought less uh, rainfall and, uh, and de therefore soil moisture. So we had, uh, uh, hydrological deficits uh, at the country scale. However, this, the, the, the observed impacts on water availability, on, you can see on the right side, were uneven across Mexico. So, so you were, you, th there were some regions in Mexico where uh, really face, um, this is the amount, the percentage of uh, reservoir storage uh, in every state of Mexico. And one of the, uh, the, the hardest state that was, uh, uh, hit by the drought was uh, Sinaloa, with only uh, by, by June 1st, uh, when the hydrological, which corresponds to the, uh, um, the beginning of the rainfall season, more or less, uh, the state of the reservoirs from the, at the state of Sinaloa were, had only 6.4% of storage. So they face uh, day zero scenarios, which means like running out of water, um, and, uh, and this is very important. Uh, why? Because in, in Sinaloa, such as in other states in Mexico, uh, which is uh, uh, the economy is driven by irrigation agriculture, uh, the, the, the type of irrigation remains very inefficient. Approximately 90% of Mexico's irrigated croplands are being uh, uh, is carried out using gravity and furrow uh, irrigation techniques. Um, so a lot of water is is uh, is um, is not used uh, properly, and 
because of that, uh, we, we started a, a pilot project in, in Sinaloa State, um, uh, which is Mexico's corn belt. Most of the corn is produced in, in Sinaloa. And the, the, the idea was to uh, generate or to build a, a, digital, um, a digital infrastructure uh, framework. So, so we uh, using sensors um, in situ and uh, re remotely based we could uh, know when and how much uh, water ne needs to be uh, poured uh, across the, the irrigated croplands. And we we're talking about 15,000 hectares. So this is probably, uh, is very unique probably in Mexico and maybe Latin America. Usually this type of uh, um, uh, precision irrigation projects, uh, they, they are uh, tested across, I don't know, 100, 500, uh, mostly one or 2,000 hectares. This here we, we're working. We're, we're talking about fifteen thousand hectares. Uh, and um, well, the, the first part of this project was to um, to uh, create a climate climate forecast using uh, the, the weather and, and research forecast model WORF across the Nola State. All this data uh, is uploaded on on a website uh, here at, at Inta, and so you can go go to the, this website and see uh, all this. Uh, for, the, for the, the different irrigation districts, you can see not only the forecast for seven days in temperature and uh, precipitation, but also on uh, potential evapotranspiration, which is a, ve a, a, a very um, uh, important variable for, uh, for irrigation purposes. And also this is uh, supported by uh, soil moisture data. Here we, we use, uh, we, in we install a, a few uh, commercial sensors, uh, smart sensors for soil moisture. Uh, and also uh, the, this decision support, decision support system was supported by, by pharmacy information. So here you can see uh, um, a few, uh, um, exa an, an example of how it looks at this platform, which is called Sinmap. Uh, we will host this platform, uh, will, will probably be available in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and so here the use the farmer can go uh, can go to, to the website he, he must enter a password and then he will go he will see it, it, it his uh, plot his uh, plot and then uh, other features is that oh, uh, like I said is that the the farmers themselves they are uh, uploading um, the, the different uh, data such as the type of crop that is being uh, is being um, that will be irrigated in this in that uh, cycle, and uh, of course other uh, in, important feature uh, important information such as the amount the surface the irrigated surface and the water uh, the water volume that is uh, being that will be poured on in, in the field. Uh, this is another another example. Um, so at the end, the farmers will, will have uh, will have access to different features, mostly for uh, management purposes, um, and also this this platform will is uh, will be uh, available for water managers, water management, which which are mostly who are, whose function is to oversee the operation for the whole irrigation module. And also the irrigation district authority, which is uh, shared with with Conagua, the, our national water agency. Uh, and um, another feature of this project is that we are partnering with uh, the OpenIT project, which is a, a operational system that um, uh, displays uh, very uh, evapotranspiration maps uh, across the. Uh, uh, the west of the United States. It was launched uh, probably a couple of months ago. And right now we are helping them to uh, expand this platform in Mexico. And so this is an initiative uh, by the Environmental Defense Fund um, and the technical part of this project was uh, carried out by uh, the JPL, the Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Laboratory from NASA and other academic institutions such as the USDA, uh, the Desert Research Institute, um, I mean, and, uh, so at the end, this uh, data is, uh, is, is publicly available. And uh, the interesting thing here is that it's based on um, the most uh, 
recognize uh, evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration algorithms that you can see here. So at the end, you, you can have an ensemble of, of uh, evapotranspiration and you somehow you can quantify the uncertainty the, uh, about how much water is, is being used. Uh, and then this, the last part of this of this project is uh, so now we're done with the climate forecast and now the hydrological forecast uh, and this is an example of what what was done uh, last year uh, no this this year uh, one of my students um, he developed an open open uh, yeah an open so using open source software he tested a hydrological forecast platform in uh, Costa Rica and. Um, this was done, but this was calibrated in uh, only three catchments because, of course, hydrological information is is, uh, is is scarce, like in most of Latin America. And then he uh, extrapolated that for for the rest of the country. Uh, you can see some. Uh, well, this is the architecture he he we use, and and this is some some of the results. Uh, and the, our our plan for next year is to address uh, or to focus on, on three things. The first one is demand management. Mostly we want to couple uh, our observation of soil moisture against the, our, our, uh, the forecast of evapotranspiration so we can match crop water stress. Uh, of course, we, we are planning if, if we have, uh, if this open ET platform is already uh, available in Mexico, we, we will, this, this will bring valuable information. And of course, another important thing is to address supply management mostly uh, by um, running a probabilistic uh, modeling framework for different, uh, uh, for short, mid and long terms, uh, using again this, uh, this, this model, the SMHI uh, height model, and finally our impacts on crop yield. And for that we will use, um, we will develop new drought indexes, uh, mostly based on vegetation, vegetation optical depth or soil moisture, and running that with some data, data, data science technique. So I'm, I'm open for any collaboration. And again, I, I thank you for, for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Agustin Breña. Thank you. Now is the time for Dr. Leonardo Chamorro. OK, OK. Um, hello. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Uh, I would like to talk about a little bit on something fundamental with uh, a huge um, impact for engineers and people trying to characterize particles and then to do some treat uh, of particles, different type of particles in water. So I'm faculty, I'm associate professor here at the Mechanical Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois and associated with the Aerospace Civil and um, environmental engineering and, and geology. And then my, my area is, uh, is uh, turbulence, um, uh, experimental fluid mechanics. And I work, you, I focus primarily on turbulence particle dynamics, aerodynamics, flow structure interaction with marine energy and advanced flow diagnostics. And um, we have, uh, I lead uh, our, uh, our group, uh, Renewable Energy and Turbulent Environment Group, which uh, focus on the aspect that I mentioned, that from, from the perspective of uh, turbulence. And then we tackle very uh, several problems under the same umbrella of fluid mechanics and turbulence from Eulerian and Lagrangian. Okay, so particles in water. Just, I wanted to, mentions a, a cool, very relevant, very relevant tool that we can use in the problem of particles in water. So particles in water are, are a big challenge and also offer uh, many opportunities. The, we have global ch uh, challenge uh, related to some of the talk that we hear already related to microplastic pollution. We have oil spill. We have some suspended particles, different type of particles in rivers. So we wanted to see what is the evolution, tem spatial, tem spatial and temporal evolution, of those particles, how we can collect them, how we can manage them. And then, but do, to do that, we need to characterize them fundamentally and we need to develop techniques. Uh, so we have, the problem is that we, there are 
many, many type of particles. We have a broad spectrum. We have organic, inorganic, tracer, and inertial, heavy uh, particles, uh, positive, buoyant, and then different, absolutely different kind. The spectrum is very, very, very wide. But if we can develop uh, statistical tools, then we can, we have many opportunities to protect the, the ecosystem and also use that knowledge to do some use it in the engineering processes. So, okay, so let's let's quickly this uh, one of the tools that I want I will, will like to point today. So we have uh, several, let's say, particles in in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a water environment, in water media, where we have uh, the, the fluid could be quiescent or, 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 or turbulent, and then the particle moves. And then the, if we pick two particles or select several particles and we track a simple concept, which is tracking how the distance between the particles uh, change with the time. So that is precisely, that is precisely in the field of Lagrangian dynamics. And within the Lagrangian dynamics, uh, to characterize that, how the particle evolve, the separation evolve with time, we can define uh, this quantity, so-called particle pair dispersion, which is that the square of the separation between the particles. And okay, the, the square of the, the, the separation of the particles, the distance between two trajectories, and also eventually depending on the initial separate, the initial separation, which was observed by Batchelor, was not by Batchelor in 1950. That initial separation is an important parameter. So, so uh, for tracers, so for particles that follow the flow, we have we have we have we have seen that, that um, in a quiescent medium, particles may 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 separ uh, proportional to time that we call diffusive regime. My uh, uh, in turbulent then uh, can separate uh, depending on uh, uh, as a t square, which we call it ballistic. We can we have seen also people have seen that would depend on the cubic, the power three of time that is a super diffusive or Richardson regime or other type of other type of behavior. Okay, so in all of these uh, power laws behavior, the separation uh, between particles in turbulent flow, we have problems, substantial problems, because that those laws depend on the initial separation, the relative time scale, depending on the turbulence levels. So it's a very complex problem. OK, so what about inertial particles? Inertial particles are particles that doesn't follow the flow, doesn't follow strictly the flow. Think about uh, bubbles. Think about heavy particles. They don't follow the flow strictly. So we have a big problem there to characterize. So let's let's. I wanted to point only one case, which is the case, uh, which is our uh, bubbles, possibly buoyant and in particular turbulence, uh, to illustrate this problem. Which is uh, in the case, this uh, particular turbulence is uh, convection, natural convection. So this is ray level R, ray level R convection. Hit it at the top, cold at the at the at the top, and then we have the turbulence, and we have bubbles there. Okay, so we did an, an experimental study. Uh, we put um, uh, bubbles in the relevant art convection there, and then we measure how the particle split, separates. And then, uh, so we measure those. Uh, we can see how in the A quiescent, B is a turbulent. So we have a different behavior, okay? So what we can see, the separation, if we measure the separation in quiescent medium, the particles separate as a proportional to time square, but if lateral separation depend on the time square and proportional to time. So it's a very complex behavior and also depend on the relative time. Okay, now if we move next, we move to turbulence, we see that the separation could be D squared, could be T 1.5, could be proportional to time, and depend on the initial separation. The different color represent in each dif different initial separation. So that is uh, absolutely complicated, the description of how particles, in this case bubbles, uh, separate over time. So, so here, uh, in the last few seconds, so this Technique, these quantitative techniques illustrate opportunities to quantitatively characterize particles, particles in 
quiescent media or turbulent media, and then where then with when that quantification linking turbulence to particle dispersion, we can then elaborate the formulations and help people in the management for treating those particles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leo Chamorro, for your presentation, but also for your leadership in IMAS. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now we have Dr. Christian Appendini. Thank you. Hello, you can see my slide, right? Okay, thanks very much, Elvira, for the invitation and also Rafael. I'm going to move away from water quality and water availability and talk more about the implications of structure design from the effect of, of climate change, focusing on tropical cyclone waves in the Gulf of Mexico. So a bit of my background, I'm a researcher at the Engineering Institute of the National Autonomous University in Mexico. I have a background in oceanography and coastal oceanography and a PhD in engineering from UNAM, the PhD. And I've been working half of my career in consulting and research between consulting companies in Denmark, US, and, and Spain. And 12 years ago, I joined UNAM to the recently created Coastal Processes and Engineering Lab, where I've been doing mostly work related to coastal and offshore engineering and lately focusing in extreme events, tropical cyclones and climate change, particularly their, their effects in, in, on structures and, and hazards. So I'm gonna start talking about the tropical cyclones. We know from, the, from several studies since more than 10 years ago that, that there's increasing number, well, that, that we expect an increasing um, wind speed for, from the most extreme tropical cyclones in tropical areas. But the last report from the IPCC says with high confidence that the proportion of intense tropical cyclones, those are categories four and five, and the peak wind speeds of the most intense tropical cyclones are projected to increase at a global scale with increasing global warming. And from that, we have seen that there's a lot of studies related to the wind hazards and the, and the storm surge hazards. But there's not that much work related to the extreme waves, which actually at the end, they are the forces are impacting to the, to, to the structures in the coast and also in offshore structures. And there are the main parameter to select which are the structures we're going to use. Of course, under climate change, we need to, talk, to think about other solutions and not just building higher structures. But in offshore engineering, we still need the structures and we need to do a, a, a good design of those structures, a good selection of those structures. And for that, the main design parameter are the, the ocean waves. And doing a bad characterization of offshore of the, of the waves for the design will lead to failure of the structures and has, as it has happened in history. And it's not only the offshore industry, of course, we also have the, the renewable energy industry moving now to offshore. Of course, in Europe that has happened, but now the, the US is shifting towards that, that area and there's plans for several offshore um, wind field parks um, in the Atlantic where there's tropical cyclones also in the Gulf of Mexico. And in Mexico, we have the Yucatan platform, which is a particularly interesting area for, for wind, wind farms. And talking about the Gulf of Mexico, we have a lot of activities going there that are related to, which are modulated by ocean waves and particularly maritime transport and the oil and gas industry is regulated, it's, it's dictated by the extreme events. So the American Petroleum Institute uh, has been provided recommendation for mature ocean conditions since 1969 and wave data since 1976. Here's, uh, I'm not gonna go through all the timeline, but just, just quickly let me tell you that in 1947, when officially the offshore industry started, there were no guidelines. Then the APA started to fund some committees to study, but then they were disbanded. And after the 60s, when there was some stream hurricanes hitting the, the, the Northern Gulf of Mexico, the APA came up with the first standard for uh, the, their first recommendations, but there were no design waves until 1976 where they recommended the 100 year return period. And nevertheless, they have been updated 
based on the historical events. So the API uses historical events to come up with a recommendation of waves. So after the 2005 um, tropical cyclone season, when which was the, the, the season with the highest cyclonic and accumulated energy, they come up with new recommendations. And after Hurricane Ike, they also updated the recommendations and come up with new recommendations. So 2020 was another year where there was the second highest accumulated cyclone energy in the Gulf of Mexico. And it makes wonder, are we going to now include those events and come up with new recommendations? And what's gonna happen now with climate change when we're expecting more extreme events? And also in the Gulf of Mexico, are we going to update every year? It, that doesn't seem to be the, the right way to go because the structures we're, we're designing today are going to be already acting in the future in the in the future climate no in the climate in the way climate with the effects of, of global warming so what we are have been doing is use other other type of assessment of course we can always think we can use the tropical cyclone events from the global circulation models which has been used by several researchers under the calculus group which is the coordinated ocean wave climate experiment uh, project, sorry, and but using the the wind fields from the global circulation models doesn't seem to be the best idea because the wind fields the the wind intensities are underestimated, and also the tropical cyclone frequency. And if we want to look to particular areas like the Gulf of Mexico, the resolution is is too low, too 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 small. Sorry, uh, it's too coarse. Sorry, and uh, so that the enclosures are poorly resolved. So. That doesn't seem to way to go. So what we have been done, doing is using tropical cyclones, um, synthetic tropical cyclones, which are derived from the physics of the tropical cyclones, where protostorms or, or, or vortices of 12 seconds per meter are seeded randomly across the ocean. And depending on the ocean conditions, water temperature and, and um, the, and the atmospheric conditions, that is humidity, wind shear, it's uh, the, this tropical, this, this protostorms, they either, either evolve to, to become tropical cyclones, and then they are moved with this uh, large scale wind feed, uh, atmospheric features from reanalysis, or they decay and they don't, they, they do not evolve to tropical cyclones. And that way we can obtain a large number of tropical cyclones we can continue seeding these product storms until we get the survival rate we want. So if we want to have 10,000 tropical cyclones to, this, to enter in the Gulf of Mexico, we can do that. And the advantage is that this is done with reanalysis, but we can also use global circulation models as a, a steering uh, atmospheric conditions. And then we can create this tropical cyclone. So it's, it's the synthetic events are not the events derived from the global circulation, are not the events in the global circulation models, but the global circulation model information is used to derive these tropical cyclone events. So that way we do not underestimate the wind speeds. So what we've done, we have the database with the, with the tropical cyclones, and then we create the wind fields for each tropical cyclone in those database. We use six global circulation models to, to have a, to have a, a vast selection of tropical cyclones and also be able to measure the uncertainty. That information, we put it into a numerical model for waves in the Gulf of Mexico, and then we create the, the envelopes for the tropical, for each tropical cyclone we have, the maximum envelopes of, of significant wave height and, and wave period. And we have one map for each tropical cyclone. We have around 1,000 tropical cyclones for each database, present climate and future climate. And we can do the statistics for those, for those um, the extreme wave statistics with those events and then come up with wave recommendations. This is the 100 years return period, which is the most used, commonly used um, design wave. In, in offshore structures, we can see the present climate in the, in the left and the future climate in the right. This is the difference. I'm showing some uh, the oil extraction areas in Mexico or where there's exploration in the dash boxes. 
but the other boxes on top in the northern are the where the API provides provides uh, recommendation values. One minute. Thanks. If we see if we see that this the the black line is the is the values recommended by the API. The green green is the ones we obtain from the reanalysis data from the tropical cyclones derived from reanalysis data, and the blue and the red are from the global circulation models. Blue is the present climate, red is the future climate. We see the model ensemble and the uncertainty based on the deviation standard. So we can see for the West, let me show this one. We can see in the West area of the API, the uncertainty it's covering what the API and the historical we get. But we can see that if we see the mean of the ensemble, we see that there is a clear increase in the future climate. And what does that mean? That means that if we use a hundred years re return period from the present climate to design one wave, what well, as a design as a design wave for a structure, it's a 14 meters, but that in a few years is going to be the 34 return period. So that means that if we use a hundred years return period wave, the probability of that wave occurring in the design life of 30 years of a structure is 26%. But if that moves to a 30 to a 30 years return period, the chances of that event to occur increases to 64%. So that the probability of failure really increases if we don't use the correct um, this wave wave this wave height for for the design of the structure. So basically, the the conclusions is that. We cannot rely on the historical information. We can use uh, synthetic events and and use non-stationary wave climates to to determine the design the design waves and then reduce the probability of, of failure for for offshore structure. So those are the collaborators, and thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Christian Appendini, for your presentation. Now we have Dr. Rachel Poretsky, and I will share your slides here. Excellent. Um, so uh, I'm a um, microbial ecologist and um, I guess my, my interest slide isn't on here, but I, I am a associate professor at um, the University of Illinois in Chicago. There we go. <laughs> and um, I've I've been here for about seven years. I've um, I got my PhD also in um, oceanography in an, in a marine science department, specifically in microbial ecology at the University of Georgia. And I'm um, really interested in microorganisms. These are uh, bacteria, archaea, viruses, um, the, the small things that control some of the things that have come up in earlier talks this morning. Um, there's uh, more microbial cells on earth than there are uh, stars <laughs> in the sky. Um, about 60% of the biomass on earth is uh, microbial. And if you look in seawater, um, about five mils or so has between one and five million bacteria. Um, and about 10 times as many viruses. So they're really abundant and um, control a lot of the, the processes, like I was saying, a lot of the processes um, on uh, nutrient processes and stuff. So that first slide um, <laughs> was showing uh, where we do this work. I don't know what happened to that one, but um, where we do uh, microbial ecology. Yeah. So what I was going to say, uh, uh, some of this is in um, ocean environments, um, around the world, uh, some of it in coastal environments, some in lakes. Um, so we do a lot of uh, sampling of aquatic environments and looking at um, microbial processes. Um, so in, um, in Chicago specifically, we're interested in our <laughs> backyard uh, aquatic environments, namely the Chicago River and Lake Michigan. And both of these have implications for things that um, Professor Kalita mentioned. Um, and I think even uh, Professor Tinoco about um, nutrients that enter uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So both of these systems eventually connect to, um, to the Gulf of Mexico via a number of tributaries along the way. Um, the Chicago River was designed um, 
to, well, expanded and, and designed by the Army Corps of Engineers to handle wastewater. And so um, we are interested in um, the effects of that. Um, Chicago does not discharge wastewater into Lake Michigan because that's where we get our drinking water from, but uh, about a hundred different wastewater um, reclamation plants around uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, all around uh, the, the um, Lake Michigan do discharge um, treated wastewater. Um, so our work is um, in these systems is really um, understanding the effects of that, both in terms of microbial communities um, and their processes and the effects of those um, discharged into the environment. Um, so one of the things um, that we've done is look for the effects of disinfection. So wastewater is treated in, in wastewater treatment plants and then some disinfect um, the wastewater before or the treated <laughs> water um, before discharging into the environment. Um, so we've done some experiments in the lab looking at the effects of um, that disinfection. In this case, this picture shows um, UV. So we built a, a in the lab, collimated beam apparatus to mimic disinfection, UV disinfection, um, and figure out the effects of that on um, microbial communities in um, river water. Uh, we are also um, looking at uh, various sites upstream and downstream of um, the locations of wastewater discharge into the Chicago River. So uh, there's three big wastewater treatment plants that service the city of Chicago um, that are dotted along the, the um, Chicago River and uh, discharge into it. And so uh, the Army Corps of Engineers had designed the flow to um, had, had reversed the flow of the, of the Chicago River to flow away from Lake Michigan. Um, we're interested in seeing how these effects of um, microbial signatures that are discharged um, translate up and downstream of um, discharge. So along with those wastewater treatment, treatment plants, there's a number of combined sewer over, um, overflows or outfalls that um, are handle stormwater that, and the, those are all the black dots along the Chicago River. Oh, next slide, yeah. So uh, um, these are some of my uh, students, postdoc, um, undergraduates, a number of, of um, our team looking um, at these effects on, uh, on Lake Michigan. Um, so in this case, we worked with wastewater treatment plants that discharge into Lake Michigan. This particular one is in, um, it, that's pictured here is in Wisconsin. Um, and we were looking at the effects of um, the discharge, how we see that um, for uh, going further away from the discharge into um, Lake Michigan, specifically in the context of the microbial communities and um, genes, their genes, and specifically um, antibiotic resistance. So this was a, a big team that was um, funded by the Chicago Biomedical Consortium a few years ago when we saw these um, increased numbers of antibiotic resistance genes closer, so this is a distance decay relationship, um, closer to the site of discharge. And the farther we went out into Lake Michigan, the, the less we saw the, the um, influence of, of the wastewater um, discharge. So clearly um, giving us indication that not only the composition, the community composition is affected by wastewater discharge, but also um, the genetic composition. And of course, antibiotic resistance is a major public health concern. Um, next slide. The bigger public health concern, as we're all aware of right now, is COVID. And so in the last um, year and a half, almost two years, we've pivoted um, a, a lot <laughs> to focusing on wastewater-based epidemiology to look at um, SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater and subsequently in um, the, the environments that wastewater is discharged into. Next slide. So uh, there's a number of um, sites all over the world that are doing this sort of work. Um, this is probably not even the most up-to-date map. Um, there's a dashboard called COVID-19 Poops that shows a number of um, facilities around the world that are doing this sort of work. Next slide. Um, so we've created this super team um, with a number of folks 
from UIUC, UIC, Northwestern, Argonne National Lab. We're working really closely with both the City of Chicago Department of Health. Thank you. And um, IDPH. Um, so we have a number of teams that are involved in uh, modeling and lab work. Um, we've gotten a lot of news coverage over this. Next slide. Um, uh, we're doing this in wastewater treatment plants around the state. Um, we're doing this at the Cook County Jail, O'Hare Airport, a number of locations around the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. Next slide. Um, and we're kind of comparing the what we see in wastewater with the disease prevalence in clinical cases. We're also sequencing, which kind of has put me in Omicron land in the last week and a half or so. Um, next slide. And we're interested in um, also going back to the beginning, the, the effects of um, the, the discharge into the environment. So um, I can address this in, in later when we go into breakout rooms, but um, the effect of disinfection on this. And so overall, this work is really um, important for public health um, and goes beyond COVID-19 and back to these ideas of antibiotic resistance that we've looked at in the past and just in general, um, water quality and sustainability. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Rachel Poretsky. Thank you for your presentation. Now we have uh, Dr. Andres Prada. Thank you, Elvira. Uh, hello, everybody. So my name is Andres Prada. I'm originally from the city of Bucaramanga in Colombia. Uh, where I studied my bachelor's degree in civil engineering. And then I came to the University of Illinois in 2015 to pursue my grad studies. I did my master's in agricultural and biological engineering and then my PhD in civil and environmental engineering, both with emphasis in water resources and hydrology. So Professor Tinoco, who presented earlier, was my supervisor, my advisor during my PhD. Then I'm currently working for the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. I'm doing research on microplastic pollution. So I know uh, Professor Chamorro and Professor Tinoco have already mentioned about uh, microplastics. So I'm going to give a brief uh, and basic talk about particle dynamics and surface chemistry, chemistry for microplastic transformability in saturated porous media. So by porous media in this case, I mean uh, soil. So I'm sure we all now have seen and have heard of the, these floating islands of plastic in the ocean. So um, there is a the, no, documentaries on Netflix, there is news, YouTube videos about this. So this is the most evident and alarming uh, plastic pollution that we can see. So, but they are all coming from terrestrial sources and fishing activities, you know. So these plastics are staying there uh, and they, they do not uh, break, uh, biodegrade, but instead they break down into smaller and smaller pieces. So, but let's look at the, where are they coming from? So if we look at, uh, USA facts, we see that in this country we are producing over 30 million of uh, plastic waste, waste um, every year, and only uh, less than 30% are recycled or born with uh, energy recovered. But about 60% are going to landfills. So the question is like, plastic stays forever in landfills? Uh, but the reality is when they are deposited in landfills, uh, the pl plastic starts degrading over time and breaking down as a result of the elevated temperature, pressure, hydrolysis, and microbial degradation. So um, then rainfall comes and filters through the waste and it draws out the toxic chemicals, but also the microplastics in something that we call the leachate. 
So they actually start moving out of the out of the landfill. Now, if we look at the history of plastic and here in the United States, so in the 1950s is the initiation of global mass production of plastic, and then they, we started depositing the. I'll change my pointer. Uh, depositing the plastic waste in landfills, and then by 1965, it's the first uh, legislation to manage solid waste. And there is there is this uh, window of about 25 years where all the landfills allowed uh, that leachate to infiltrate to the soil and contaminate uh, potential groundwater sources. So. Uh, from 1991, all, land, all new landfills are required to have geosynthetic liners to collect that leaching and avoid that it infiltrates to groundwater and pump that leaching that they collect to wastewater treatment plants. Um, so, but then it took us like about 20 years to start seeing uh, the microplastic and start doing research. So. Is a novel topic and very important right now. So this is the system that I was talking about. So we have the landfills. So before 1991 in the US, so landfills were not lined. So they allowed the leachate to infiltrate directly to the soils and, and groundwater. But now they are going this way. They should go this way and pump the the microplastic to the wastewater treatment plants. But the problem is like wastewater treatment plants are not designed to degrade the plastic. The so plastic is going through the process and then they exit the system uh, to the biosolids, the sludge and the wastewater treatment effluent. Uh, we have found in other studies also that 99% of the microplastics are accumulating in the biosolids and the biosolids are basically sold as fertilizers um, for crops. So they are putting the plastics back in the environment where the rainfall again can like drag them into the soils and the groundwater. And there is also like 1% that goes directly to the rivers and creeks where the effluents are discharged. So how the microplastic look like? Um, they are a small pieces of less than five millimeters with irregular shapes, most commonly in the forms of fragments and fibers. So here uh, we see a photo taken with the microscope. Uh, so this is a real sample collected from a wastewater treatment plant influent. So we see a lot of the fibers that are potentially coming from domestic washing machines. And, and we see any other kinds of uh, pieces of plastic there. And look at the scale. This is in the scales of microns. So these are uh, the actual microplastics that we can find in the environment and that we are producing. Now, we are talking that they are going back to the environment or they can infiltrate directly from landfills to the soil. So the question is, how are they transported in the soil? So Professor Chamorro was teaching us about uh, inertial particles and how we have to consider uh, all the physics and dynamics uh, when we are working with these kind of particles. So, um, so for groundwater uh, contaminant transport, there is a whole theory with a lot of background um, about dissolved contaminants, but are they actually behaving uh, as, as a dissolved contaminant? So Professor Chamorro was, was showing um, all the considerations that we, we need to to take, but he was talking about turbulence, but in, in soils at this scale, we have no turbulence. We have laminar flow. So these are, these are the streamlines of our flow. 
So the question is like this little fragment or the fiber are actually following the streamline and, and traveling with the flow, or they have their own dynamics and they have their own paths. So if we want to make sure of what kind of particles we are dealing with, Professor Chamorro also mentioned the Stokes number really briefly, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So the Stokes number is a dimensionless number that relates, relates the response of the particle, how fast the particle can move with the flow to the time scale of the smallest uh, fluid motion to determine if the particle really follows the flow. That means many? The, the, the Stokes number is less than one or is greater than one. So we, we see here the Stokes number. So I made this plot with uh, some of the characteristic velocities in porous media and particle sizes and shapes. And we see that some of the plastic that we can find in the environment are actually inertial particles. So we, con we need to consider that in our models. But also the problem becomes more complex when we realize that in, in our soils, there is also air boundaries, there is soil minerals, there is microbes, there is electrostatic and chemical interaction. So it is a very, very complex problem if we want to address the microplastics from their sources. Um, so we have seen that microplastics are uh, changing their surface properties over time. We call it weathering. And that transformation affects the polarity and surface char charge. So that means that we are doing some experiments on microfluidic devices to see at the scales of micron how uh, our microplastics can attach to a soil boundary. So we, we, have, we see here a little piece of microplastic that in less than a second, it get closer to the boundary and it attaches to it. This is mostly what I have today. I will take any questions later. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very, very much, Dr. Andres Prada. Now we have Dr. Jurgen Malnecht. You will share. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation. And uh, my presentation will be about the Bayesian approach for simultaneous recognition and of contaminant sources in groundwater and surface water source resources. May I present myself? I am researcher of the water science and technology at Techno uh, research group at, Te at Tecnológico de Monterrey. Uh, and I work also as research, as my associate research professor since 2004. Previously, I worked in other institutions and in, in, in the civil engineering uh, industry. Uh, I have a master's degree in water and wastewater management and engineering and hold, I'm holding a PhD in hydrogeology. My research interests are water resource management, hydrogeochemistry, isotope hydrology, groundwater contamination and remediation. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm working at the Tecnológico de Monterrey system in the campus Monterrey. It's a system with 26 campi and was founded uh, nearly 80 years ago. It's a non-profit uh, organization and with over 70,000 students. And uh, a, our research group is focused mainly on water science and technology. Uh, specifically, this is, uh, we have a smaller uh, group working on geosciences uh, and all the uh, environmental geosciences problems. Now I am presenting uh, the, the topic. Uh, it, the, the understanding of diffuse pollution is a key to providing an appropriate management plan for protecting water resources. So many times we have uh, diffuse contamination in water uh, because there is a a complicated uh, source mixing processes involved. So a, a case is nitrate, nitrate contamination has uh, normally different sources like atmospheric deposits and other surface activities such as fertilization, such as uh, sewage, etc. 
And um, this uh, contaminant is threatening the aquatic ecosystems and human health. Environmental tracers can help to, to solve this source mixing problem. Uh, the classical method is a, a newer uh, stable isotope mixing model. Unfortunately, this conventional uh, met method cannot reflect the various uncertainties, such as there is an overlapping in the distribution among various pollutants, and there is also a, a spatial and temporal vari variability throughout the year and in, uh, in each poll pollutant source. And also there are several processes involved which are bio-biochemically controlled and uh, which uh, provokes uh, fractionation processes and changes in the isotopic composition. And uh, another, another problem related is that um, many sources are, are present, but there are only a few tracers available. And so the constraints are very limited. The Bayesian mixing model can offer a source, uh, a solution uh, to overcome this uncertainty, um, including or considering uh, probability distribution of the proportional uh, contribution of each contaminant, considering the uncertainties of the input parameters. I can show here a scheme from the Bayesian mixing model, how it works. You have uh, source data and you have sample data. The source data um, have normally spatial temporal variabilities. There may be also measurement errors uh, or ranges, several ranges in the biochemical enrichments. So these are the uncertainties we have to, to uh, we are confronted. And um, on the, uh, these sources, um, on the other hand, you have the samples, you, 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 you measure in the field. And um, these uh, different uh, um, uh, sources are mixed uh, and possibly also correlated so we, we, what we do, we are doing is a, um, a recognition of this mixing process in a, a statistical program environment. So um, the outcome is a relative fraction of the different sources of contamination. So um, we can do this in a framework um, which uh, uh, consider several equations. Uh, here, the basic equation is uh, the, the isotopic value of a sample uh, is a function of the proportion of the source and uh, uh, also the source value of the isotope and uh, the, the enrichment factors of, of the isotope, as well as residual errors in the um, in, uh, uh, as a function of variation between individual mixtures. And also includes um, uh, this, this equation, uh, each of these variables have a normal distribution uh, with a mean and uh, standard deviation. So uh, this Bayesian mixing model is accompanied with a Markov chain um, uh, uh, simulation, um, and this is done in the R statistical uh, software or program uh, R, and there exist different programs. The first was SIRR, and the a newer uh, program is Mixiar. Uh, this Mixiar is the it have additional features, uh, which can include covariate uh, data, and also random functions and fixed values. So this, um, pro, uh, this, this, are, this is the basics of this Bayesian mixing model uh, developed in a statistical environment. Uh, in the con in con uh, I show you here uh, some examples, two examples, one example, one example was done in, in the Monterey urban area. Um, we tracked nitrate and sulfate sources which were uh, which are, uh, are, is a concern in groundwater for the population because groundwater is extracted um, uh, for 
water for a water supply system in Mon the Monterey area. So we uh, looked at the sources of nitrate and uh, sulfate uh, 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 sources, and we found out that there, uh, with using different geochemical indicators and relations and isotopic values, and obviously at the end we found out that we have we we, we, we could we could uh, evaluate the proportion of each of these uh, sources: atmospheric deposition, organic sources, manure, sewage. So we can could evaluate the percentages. You can see the, on the right side the different distributions in the different groundwater groups. And also there is another case in the north of Mexico in Comarca Lagunera. Uh, Comarca Lagunera is famous for the livestock agriculture as, as a livestock agriculture area. And uh, we combined ge geochemical tracers, stable isotopes and the mixier model and uh, found the different sources. We, here we have more sources we could, could, we could find out even uh, develop a specific uh, sources as uh, fertilizers based on nitrate and ammonia and also uh, other sources in the nitrate as a nitrate for nitrate. As a conclusion, the goal of this uh, investigation is to estimate the mixing fracture among designated sources. The Bayesian framework has strengths in terms of a, a source apportionment and uh, uh, it helps us to improve the confidence level of the estimation. Uh, however, uh, we, uh, lack of constraints produce large changes in source apportionment. So we propose for future outlook for as a future outlook for research to to improve the method, repeating samples of sources and mixtures, which could be costly, but there is also cheaper to to include uh, geochemical parameters or microbiological approaches, or, or incorporate covariate information from land use land cover. Thank you uh, to, the, to the, our partners and, and who assisted us in the research. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Jurgen Malknecht. Thank you for your presentation. Now is the time for Dr. Paul Davidson. I'm going to share here with the slides. Very good. All right. Well, good morning. Thank you, Dr. De Mejia, for organizing this great symposium. I've really enjoyed hearing all the topics so far this morning. Um, I'm Paul Davidson. I'm an associate professor in ag and bioengineering. The photo here is um, showing a hydroponic system we have in our lab. And this is one of the endpoints of my research is can we treat wastewater in such a way that we can then use it to grow things like lettuce hydroponically and have it be safe for human consumption. So today I'm gonna to talk about my work on water quality, um, focus specifically on my pathogen work. Um, I also do work uh, with nutrients and ag pesticides, uh, but for today I'm gonna to focus on the, the pathogen aspect. I received my, my bachelor's, master's and PhD degrees in ag and bioengineering from U of I. I then went out to consulting. I did environmental consulting for four years, uh, primarily researching ag pesticides in the environment and looking at ways that we can uh, reduce or eliminate them from water sources. I've been back at the university as a faculty member since 2014, and my, my research generally looks at um, water quality from a non-point source perspective and ways that we can reduce the transport of contaminants um, while maintaining efficient farming operations. So working with farmers to make sure that they can still have successful uh, farming operations, but we can also improve the em environmental um, aspects. So just to set the stage a little bit, um, so when we think about uh, pathogens in water from a global perspective, um, the World Health Organization estimates that there's about 1.4 billion people that still don't have access to adequate sanitation systems. And that of course ties in with water quality because if you're not properly treating your waste, then there's a very high likelihood that some of those pathogens as well as other contaminants are getting into your water. 
worldwide, at least 250 million cases of water-related illnesses occur each year, with somewhere in the range of three to five million resulting in death. I've included the two photos here, um, just to give an example of how pathogens may get into water sources from that non-point source perspective. And so if we think of cattle farming, there's two main ways that, that you know, we could have that risk of contamination. On the left, you could have cattle directly accessing a river or stream or a ditch that connects to a larger body of water. On the right, we have a very high density um, feedlot operation where either that manure needs to be disposed of or it could be direct runoff from the feedlot into nearby water sources. So I'm gonna talk about three different pathogens that my research team has worked with in the past. Um, I'm gonna go through them and a little bit of the work that we've done pertaining to, the, to each pathogen. The first one is rotavirus. Um, this is a pathogen that's probably impacted all of us. Some estimations say that all people in the world, or 95% of all people in the world, have been infected with rotavirus by the age of five. It causes gastrointestinal illness um, in both humans and animals, depending on uh, the strain, and it's transmitted fecal orally, so in the feces of an infected individual, and then consumed by the host of another individual. Um, a little more than 600,000 deaths worldwide due to rotavirus infection, um, but there is now a vaccine available. So my seven-month-old daughter just recently got this rotavirus vaccine. It's an oral vaccine. Kids love it because it's very sweet, um, but it, it can be too expensive for many developing countries. And so it's only widely used in, in more developed countries where it's more affordable or where people can afford it. That's a picture of a rotavirus particle there. Um, I was just showing that it does have spike proteins on the outer surface, and that's what's uh, responsible for attaching to a host. A second pathogen that we've worked with, and Dr. Kalita, who presented earlier, has been heavily involved in this work also. Um, Cryptosporidium parvum um, became well known after the Milwaukee, Wisconsin outbreak in 1993. It's still the largest waterborne outbreak in U.S. history. Uh, 400,000, just a little bit more, became ill. 4,400 hospitalized and over 100 people died. The total cost was about $96 million. Um, that could be healthcare costs, you know, figuring out the problem and fixing the problem and all of those associated costs. The picture there is um, showing uh, cryptosporidium in its uh, oasis form. So that's how you would see it in the environment. Um, that oasis protects it from many of our common um, disinfection processes. So chlorine in many cases does not remove it. Um, but I'll show a little bit later, it is a larger particle. So we do have an advantage there that we can, in some cases, more easily remove it through, through filtration. And then the third one I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about is cyclospora. And this one kind of starts to show the connection between uh, water quality and food safety. So this, uh, this was a news article I'm showing here a few years ago. There was a foodborne outbreak in McDonald's lettuce and the cause was cyclospora. Um, and so the most likely way that cyclospora was getting in to the lettuce was through contaminated irrigation water. And so you start to think back is, well, in order to prevent that from happening, we need to successfully treat the irrigation water. So then when we irrigate the, the lettuce or whatever food crop we have, we're reducing or preventing that potential foodborne outbreak. Uh, this outbreak, um, I guess, is important for us in Illinois because Illinois actually had the most cases of cyclospora infection um, of any within that particular foodborne outbreak. This shows a comparison, a relative comparison of particle size. So if that's a sand particle on the far right, then cyclospora would be represented there, the eight to 10 micrometers. Cryptosporidium is just a little bit smaller. And then you can see it compared to clay and silt particles. Rotavirus um, is 70 nanometers. It's significantly smaller. 
And so we're dealing with a wide range of particle sizes. And so I mean, our, tre our treatment approach needs to reflect that. And then we've, we've tested a range of soil types that also vary in, in the makeup of sand, silt, and clay. This shows that um, there's many ways that pathogens can get into water. What I'll highlight here is that we don't often think about the role of wildlife in transmission. So we looked at our wildlife um, transmitting cyclospora um, and we focused on CSOs in the Chicago area. Um, and so we'll move on to the next one. Um, one of the ways from an ag engineering perspective that we can eliminate or remove pathogens is through vegetated filter strips. Dr. Kalita touched on this. Um, and so we've created a, a system in the lab where we can simulate a filter strip. It's small, so we can contain all the runoff, which is important for, for human pathogens. Um, that's required for biosafety level two. And then we'll go on to the next one. We saw that soil as a very good filter. Um, we saw that it's different depending on the pathogen. So sand particles were more effective at removing rotavirus from uh, surface runoff. But in contrast, cryptosporidium was um, removed at a higher rate due to clay particles. And so we can take those kinds of findings into account when we look at designing um, a vegetated filter strip. And then results from that cyclospora study where we sampled um, from CSOs, we sampled water, soil, and uh, feces from wildlife. And what we found was there were um, across three different CSOs that we sampled, there were 13 positive samples from wildlife, seven from soil, and one from water. And so we found that, yes, we can find cyclospora presence in all of those different um, sources, but it looks like wildlife may be more of a factor than we previously thought. And it's probably something that we need to make sure we incorporate into all of our sampling studies when we're concerned about the, the transmission of pathogens to water that could be used for irrigation for, for human food crops. So I think that's all I had. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul Davidson for your presentation. And now we have Dr. Ravel Antonio Cervantes. One minute, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. De Mejia. Uh, thank you also for the invitation for the organization. Today, I will talk about the determination of the occurrence and fate of metal-based nanoparticles in the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, my background is as a chemical engineer, and then I move to the environmental issues, environmental engineering, mainly in the water science. I did a master and the PhD in water science and technology. Then I moved to Japan to learn about the heterocatalysis, the homocatalysis too. Then I moved to, to the States to learn more about the nanotechnology and water. And that's, that's my current uh, research uh, development. So when we talk about the, 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 the fate and the occurrence of nanomaterials, we need to think about what are the commercial products that use nanoparticles. In this case, you can see that uh, silver nanoparticles are commonly used in some products, in personal care products, in textiles, has uh, socks, uh, other uh, uses in the medical uh, customs also to use uh, nanoparticles. Uh, as you can see also in, 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 the, in Asia, there are a lot of uh, personal care products using silver nanoparticles, but we don't know what would happen after we use these nanoparticles. Uh, if you are not familiar with uh, silver nanoparticles attached to a surface used to release some uh, silver ions, commonly, uh, and I mean, not commonly, it's millenary tradition that silver used to act against some microorganisms. That's, that's why silver use, uh, was used in pottery and, and many stuff in kitchen uh, to avoid the road of microorganisms. But when the, uh, we are in the nanoscale, that phenomena increase and are potentialized. In this case, if we think about the fate of nanoparticles, 
we will see uh, which uh, that wastewater treatment plants going to be one of the intermediary uh, fates of silver nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about how we can detect such nanoparticles in wastewater. There is no method uh, right now. The, the US EPA, uh, it's very involved to trying to detect them because we don't know the, the effects, mainly because we don't know the exact concentrations. We will find several techniques as UVBs and Raman spectroscopy with some limitations. For example, the concurrence of other uh, substances as organic matter or even other salts, uh, microorganisms that may interfere the detection of nanoparticles. If we think about the TEM or microscopy techniques, we, we can conclude that we, we can see nanoparticles, but we can not calculate the concentration. In other hand, we will see a synchrotron radiation. We know that it's very powerful technique. However, it's not available for all of us, right? Uh, in this uh, project, we try to use the single particle ICPMS approach but we don't know, we didn't know what, how fast or uh, accurate can be. So uh, the, this technique is mainly based in the measurement of a cloud of ions and knocking the detector of the mass spectroscopy. Uh, there are some advantages uh, of this technique that we can calculate if we assume that uh, there is an sphere knocking the detector, no, this cloud of ions, can be related with a nanoparticle diameter and then a size. We can also calculate the concentration of nanoparticle in mass and in units per uh, liter uh, in a sample. However, the limitation is the amount of data that we are gonna have. Uh, that's why we don't need, uh, I mean, we will have uh, a lot of information and we can only detect one element at a time. So this is a very good approach to try it. So we, we try to detect this uh, nanoparticles, first uh, silver nanoparticles in a wastewater treatment plant. As I told you, we visit a, a, a conventional treatment in, in Santa Barbara in California to try to detect the nanoparticles in the wastewater and along the stream of wastewater in this system. So we collect several samples in the red dots. You will see that we collect uh, uh, raw with water, the effluent, and also the reclaimed water used for irrigation of uh, golf uh, field, of course. And we also uh, measure the backwash water from the uh, membrane system. We also try to detect or determine the incidence of nanoparticles uh, there as well as the persistence. We spike model nanoparticles around 30, uh, no, 300 nanograms per liter of silver nanoparticles, and we try to, to, to track the transformation, at least the dissolution of these nanoparticles in different wastewater streams. First, the challenge was try to calibrate this technique. As you can see, we need kind of buffers to calibrate the detection of nanoparticles. We perform calibration from zero nanograms per liter up to 500 uh, nanograms per liter, and uh, we conclude that the citrate uh, nanoparticles uh, coated by citrate gonna be very uh, good to calibrate the detection uh, rather than just pure water. In water is used to release the ions, especially from the surface, right? Then what are the real concentrations? This is awesome because at the inflame we, we detect only 14 nanograms per liter of silver and in the reclined water less than 0.5 nanograms per liter. This is a low concentration. But if you think about what is uh, going uh, the backwash water, we will see that the backwash water is returned to the reactor in the, in the wastewater treatment plants. So it's uh, quite probable that uh, nanoparticles are gonna be a, a storage in these units along the treatment. And also one profit is that the size of these nanoparticles are clearly below 100 nanometers. And also it's interesting that we could detect up to 18 nanometers because there is a kind of uh, overlapping in between background uh, signals in the detector. As you can see here, uh, there are some predicted concentration and, and the real concentration in this case is in the uh, lower bound levels predicted for several big cities around the world. 
has time course, you can see here that uh, uh, the concentration of ions increase suddenly has the time course. This means that nanoparticles gonna be uh, gonna release the ions present in the wastewater. That is also related with the chemical composition of each wastewater streams. As you can see here in the reclaimed water, after you add a lot of chloride for disinfection, uh, the nanoparticles gonna be dissolved. Yeah, so it's also quite probable the nanoparticles gonna settle down in each wastewater stream. One minute. Okay, uh, the original size of nanoparticles was more persistent in the real wastewater. In the other cases, nanoparticles tend to, tend to agglomerate and form aggregates that are gonna settle down later. So if we track for other elements, we perform a big campaign to detect that uh, iron and magnesium and titanium dioxide nanoparticles are gonna be more present rather than, than silver nanoparticles. Same in the sludge, the anaerobic sludge is gonna store a lot of nanoparticles, at least uh, for these elements. As conclusions, I would like to say that uh, occurrence of nanoparticles is really, it's really related with the chemical composition of the wastewater. And now we have real concentrations to evaluate the toxic effects of these nanoparticles, at least in the wastewater treatment plants and in the environmental uh, matrices. Thank you to all institutions that support this research. I, I really believe that we have more uh, to figure out, uh, especially in collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pavel Antonio Cervantes for your nice presentation. Now we have uh, Dr. Juan Armando Flores de la Torre sharing his presentation. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation problem. Uh, Ready. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will talk to you about the effect of mining tailings on water contamination by heavy metals. I am part of a research group made up of Dr. Argelia Lopez, Jaime Cardoso, Mariana Ramirez. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this event. Uh, the Autonomous University of Zacatecas is an open door institution and everyone is welcome. Uh, I am professor uh, of University of Zacatecas, where he both teaches and researches. I am received uh, doctorate grade in biology, toxicology, and environmental bioengineering from the Universidad Autónoma de Aguascalientes. And I am published in the World Journal of Microbiology and Biotechnology, Bulletin of Environmental Contamination and Toxicology interest in the absorption of lead phosphates, elimination of fluoride ions in water for human consum consumption, using hydroxyapatite as an absorbent. Uh, tailings are the main waste produced from gold mining and containing large amounts of, of heavy metals. When there are high concentrations of heavy metals in the environment, it generates a serious health problem throughout the world due to its non-degradative nature. This makes them persistent and therefore uh, long-term effects on the ecosystem. Uh, we can see the effect of the mining industry in this image uh, that are taught the process is essential. It must be more uh, sustainable. The literature reports the meaning generates large amounts uh, of waste rich in pollutants, including metals and metalloids the, that may or may not be available for incorporation in the trophic chain. In this image, we observe 
an area that contains mining waste in which high levels of copper and zinc have been found with concentration of more than 2,000 and 8,000 uh, parts per million, respectively, marked in red in these zones, an area that is currently surrounded by urbanizations uh, in this image uh, can be observed uh, uh, urbanization uh, around. Uh, in the same way, uh, we observe the results of lead in the, this same area with levels above 5,000 parts per million. On the left side, we observe another area in which the waste is part of baseball park and completely surrounded by urbanization. What is the effect of mining? how the waste generate on water pollution? Well, uh, the first factor is that the deposit of waste exceeds the permissive limits, generating mountains of waste. So the mobility of the waste is greater, causing uh, dispersion due to the effect of the wind. Rain is uh, another factor that generates mobile mobility of the waste metals taking in, into account that the pH in, of the soil and the rain is an in a important factor. Therefore, the metals can get to move to nearby stream and under underground rivers. So the remediation alternatives that we consider possible in the face of this problem are the use of plants, bacteria, establishers, uh, such as, as biofuels or a mixture of all the of the this focusing or work on the phytostabilization uh, of mining waste. We have found endemic plants that are capable of surviving adverse conditions, such as meaning waste, since their organic matter content oscillates around 2% and water retention is 80% lower than the soil. However, these plants that we observe, and in addition, to surviving these conditions that I mentioned are also capable of living in high concentration of pollutants such as metals among the, the art plants, Barcayanthus aligne, Cortaderia sejoana, Dahlia bicolor, Esporobolus aeroides, Asclepias linoria, Asphodelus pistelopis. In these plants, we found uh, interesting results. Regarding the amount of metals that they absorb, we did analysis of lead and zinc concentration in each section of the plants, leaf, stem, root, and we calculate the ability and translocation factors that give us an idea of the accumulation of metal in the plant with respect to the concentration present in the mining waste residue. We observe that Cortaderia sejoana and uh, Barcleyanthus aligne have these factors very low in these points, which indicates that these plants do not accumulate uh, metals in their biomass. biomass. In, this, in the same senses, we carry out an experiment and a logarithmic analysis that allows us to visualize the impact of plants on the waste and we find that the accumulation index decreases by modifi modifying the metal concentrations in the waste, classifying the points where the plants are highly contaminated zone 
to moderately uh, contamination uh, for effect these plants uh, Sporobolus aeroides and Cortaderia sejoana. According to these results, one of the best options is Sporobolus aeroides in the pH uh, 7. And another of the best options, according to the results in uh, some pH is the 7.3 is uh, uh, the plant Cortaderia sejoana. A minute. This is based on the fact that uh, we have two types of plants. Those that have the ability for hyperaccumulation metals or those that have ability but not hyperaccumulation metals. For use the best options in the last one, the one uh, that survives in mine waste and it must absorb metals since what we are looking for, as I mentioned, have uh, above these two apply phytostabilization uh, tools. Uh, well, uh, other uh, mechanisms is bacterial. Uh, they have your transformation mechanisms such oxidation, reduction, and other mechanisms uh, we, uh, we uh, have found, and con uh, found uh, bacteria capable of surviving in 100 or 100 parts per, per million of fully viability lead in vitro. This is other bacteria. Uh, <coughs> Therefore, if the areas of meaning waste are intervened with plants, bacteria that help the development of plants and biocarbon, or uh, if a uh, hypothesis is that we will decrease the mobility of pollutant signs, we will reduce their availability and will not contamination. Underground drivers do the effect of leaching or surface rivers due to runoff. Uh, to verify uh, the uh, aforementioned possibility, we really on the, the Tessier technique that allows us use to evaluate it to mobility of metals. Uh, <clears throat> We obtaining uh, five phases of which the most dangerous is the intercambiable and the one linked to carbonate because the, that the metal is mobile and viable. Uh, we, we have found mobility factors of up to 1.25%. Finally, I show you one the campus of the University of Zacatecas. Here we can see a laboratory building that serves more than 2,000 students and daily. You are welcome to Autonomous University of Zacatecas. Thank you very much for the invitations. Greetings to all. Thank you very much, Dr. Juan Armando Flores de la Torre.